I went to a talk where uh, Mad Professor, the British Guyanese dub producer who contributed uh, much to Massive Attack sound, was talking about him and his how him and his mates would uh, would buy 12-inch LPs for the unofficial B side of the release rather than the official A side. And afterwards, I had a chat with Mad Professor and Mark Stewart from the band The Pop Group, two stalwarts of the legendary 80s and 90s multicultural music scene in Bristol. <clears throat> and all of us agreed that the entire scene that lauded these B-side remixes rather than the A-side was a kind of B-side in itself. This notion of the unofficial, unpromoted, but often more welcoming alternative to the official is something that could be applied to the geography that surrounded the music, high-rise estates doubling as pirate radio stations and concrete canvases for graffiti artists, barbershops selling bootleg mixtapes, terrace houses as blues party venues, hinterland topographies hosting illegal street parties. These were the spaces uh, that contain the pulse of multicultural working class life in places like Bristol and Sheffield, the city where I was born and raised. They were where you could find a type of multiculturalism that was antithetical to the pretty corporate commodified multiculti of something like new labour. Um, they were organic clandestine meeting spaces for those of us living on the B side of Britain with little chance of ever being documented properly. This term, the B-side then, gives name to a psychic geography that held a community together and offered a reminder of an alternative way of being, that not everything needs to be swallowed up by the mainstream. I grew up in a place called Firth Park in Sheffield in the 1990s, and the area takes its name from the industrialist Mark Firth, who created housing for his steel workers. Generations of my family were employed uh, at his steelworks um, and in the aftermath of World War II, Britain needing to rebuild itself cheaply and facing a shortage of labour, invited workers from the colonies to plug the gap and so my Firth Park was one that belonged to Yemeni, Jamaican and Pakistani communities. Firth Park was uh, committed to celluloid as the backdrop for the film The Full Monty. And that film was released in 1997, uh, curiously, the year Tony Blair came to power. And in its depiction, reduced Firth Park's multiculturalism into a more monolithic white working class identity. But my group of friends consisted of Thomas, a 6'3 rugby playing white lad in Wales, a Muslim Yemeni footballing genius, Adrian, who had Tanzanian heritage and loved Britpop, Kieran, who was Jamaican and a brilliant DJ, Chris, a white lad whose dad was the local vicar, and Leon, a hip hop loving white boy who could speak Patois better than any of us could uh, because he'd grown up in the Caribbean area of Pittsmore. We weren't angels, any of us, and when together we looked less like a United Colours of Benetton ad than you might imagine. But um, looking back, we were beautiful. We had no idea how beautiful we were, how amazingly patient we were with each other's differences, how linked we were by shared experiences, how convivial and multicultural this all was. We just played football together, got dressed up to hang out on street corners and, and chat up girls, made mixtapes from pirate radio stations, sometimes for those girls, and pieced together a life for ourselves uh, out of the backwash of late capitalism. I bought all my branded clothes from the discount stores, Windsor's World of Shoes and Cromwell's Madhouse, but told people I'd bought them from a posher store like House of Fraser. Then the system that had produced us encouraged us to identify with brand names and be entrepreneurs. The one that told us history had ended uh, began to reject us. We weren't capitalist enough because we couldn't afford to be. We didn't know how it worked. Private school comedians like, like Adam Buxton, Sasha Baron Cohen and Matt Lucas would have called us chavs, the British term for lower working class people who reappropriate uh, re luxury brand names. Cohen and Lucas, who produced the world's most famous Chav parodies, Ali G and Vicky Pollard, were uh, incidentally educated at the same elite private school. And around the same time, a book called Crap Towns was produced, mocking places that would become Brexit heartlands little over a decade later. We'd left comprehensive school and entered the real world of new labour, one that, unlike Thatcherism, told us we were cared for by the system, quietly suggested we were now heading towards being middle class. People started to call my mate Leon a wigger, which to me seemed like an incredible assault on his willingness to embrace more than one culture, more than one culture, but still British. <clears throat> 
And the figurative and literal architecture of New Labour's multiculturalism seemed designed only for those who could afford to enter what Marc Augier famously designated uh, non-places, upmarket hotel lobbies, business lounges at airports. During the New Labour years, I noticed how this notion of multiculturalism became detached from the identity of working class culture and woven into the global current, the, the, the currents of globalization. Localities trounced in favor of international commodities, divorced from a meaningful role in the working class imagination. Multiculturalism could be seen on billboards found in elite international spaces, but the neoliberal project that was failing people co-opted multiculturalism as it was undermining it. There was a global elite, an underpaid poor, more immigration to fill the labour market, working classes left to their own devices to forge goodwill with newcomers, while the right-leaning press vilified not their privately educated friends, the business owners, but the new proletariat with different accents. Immigrants uh, were being used to fuel free trade, were, pri were encouraged privately by the private sector, but vilified publicly in the mainstream press, used as scapegoats by senior members of New Labour like David Blunkett, Home Secretary for New Labour, and a man who incidentally was the MP for my Sheffield constituency, and who went on record to say that uh, Britain's schools and the schools in my area were being swamped by immigrants. If Afropean was something that could attempt to address this issue, I needed to find out what lay behind or beyond its brand. I'd found it first in music and fashion, so it was a brand that was black spun and authored, but that's all it was uh, in the 90s and noughties. A sort of pleasant idea that was being sold to me and it involved PR companies, stylists, fashion photographers and art direction. In Britain, it was this sort of veneer of corporate, um, this vision, sorry, of corporate uh, multiculturalism, this veneer of inclusion that Tony Blair's New Labour had used in, a, in an attempt to make Britain appear international, open-minded, forward-thinking and ready for business in the global economy without affecting policies for long-term change in the way Britain treated its immigrants. I wondered, did Afropean only include beautiful, economically successful and often light-skinned black people? Afropean as aspiration, and I write about this in my book, was one thing, but as I was writing about this interplay between black and European cultures, I realized this utopian vision of a black European experience would mean willfully ignoring realities shared by a majority of black people living in Europe. It had mean making the numerous groups of unemployed black men I saw at train stations or the African women cleaning toilets or the disenfranchised communities struggling in the hinterlands of cities completely invisible. It also seemed disingenuous to leave out my own culturally rich, if also less glamorous experience of growing up mixed race in Britain and how it felt to travel Europe as somebody who identifies as black. It became apparent that I should let my readers know where I was coming from in order that they might better understand where I was heading, which was the underdocumented areas of Europe that often contradict the homogenized monoculture depictions suggested by tourist boards and pocket-sized travel guides. I was also traveling during a time when a multicultural backlash suggesting the likes of me represented some sort of failed temporary experiment was sweeping across the continent and it felt it was time and I felt it was time to regroup and reassert my own plurality as part of a larger mission to suggest how multiculturalism might work beyond the pages of a reactionary press in the very real multiculturalism embedded in my own heritage and in the streets of European cities. Afropean had to be more than, to paraphrase the Labour MP John Crudus, an obsession with an authentic search for the self and something more like a contribution to a community with its trade-offs and compromises. It had to build a bridge over that dividing fence that says whether you're in or out and form some sort of informal cultural coalition. I'd read a lot of valuable academic research and sociological theory, but all too often I felt that this was gathering dust in universities or preaching to the converted, uh, written or cited more often by wealthy, educated white scholars than the people being written about and couched in a standoffish academic vernacular. Formal, formal education is often driven by someone else's knowledge. Uh, who authorised and shaped its rhetoric? Whose knowledge is it? Who has access to it? What about black Europe beyond the desk of a theorist, a theorist found in the equivocal and untidy lived experiences of the communities?
black Europe from the street up. Nobody was interested in my book proposal in the early days. In fact, uh, I remember trying to pitch it to somebody um, and them telling me, oh, it's already been done. Carol Phillips has done it. And uh, Carol Phillip, they were talking about Carol Phillips' European Tribe, which was written the year I was born. <laughs> uh, so, so, so it was like, oh, we've already had our, 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 a book that kind of deals with uh, being black in Europe, even though his book was more about being black in white Europe. And my, my book's kind of more about being black in black Europe. Uh, so I set up a Facebook page um, before this Cambridge Analytica scandal and before we knew what it was doing with all our information uh, for people to share their stories, for people uh, living in the wake of European imperialism who were juggling um, multiple identities. Um, and I set it up for them to be able to anchor themselves to this loose concept I call Afropean. Um, this community could also give each other tips about where to visit in say Stockholm or Marseille. And an alternative unofficial map of the continent began to emerge. My book was powered by the goodwill of this community. When I was in Lisbon, um, for instance, I went to an unofficial favela-like settlement on the outskirts of a um, town called Cova de Mora, um, which it was said it was a no-go zone for police and uh, you know people were really worried about me going there. But I put out a call to the community and sure enough, someone had a cousin who had a friend who could get me in. I was broke, but my, my currency was, was, my culture, um, uh, was my culture. When I wrote this book, it um, had to allow communities in Europe, black communities in Europe, to talk to each other through the narrative even if they weren't sort of talking to each other in reality, and then feed back into this online community, strengthen the autonomous website I'd set up, afropean.com, um, that had to answer to no one. My book was um, published by Penguin, but I take pride in the fact that I wrote uh, the first draft of it completely independently, um, and I, I've set up this community um, that I'm a I have this community, should I say, that I'm a part of, uh, that doesn't need to answer to any commissioning editor. Um, this, this, the themes in this book aren't going anywhere, and whether I would have signed a deal with Penguin or not, uh, this work would have still found, found way to a community. And I think it's an unprecedented time to do this. Um, we really can cut out the middleman, um, because though it's nice to be recognised by the establishment, the establishment can destroy by assimilation. And when you follow your own star and keep at it and keep your community with you, the world will come calling and the discussion will be on the terms that you set.